Welcome to a Road Less Traveled podcast. I'm your host, Hilary Heron, and this is the virtual edition. Today we have with us Grené, who is a car dealer from the Southeast. And we're going to talk a little bit about the unique challenges that women face in the automotive industry and some of the great things too, and perhaps even some things that will encourage women to consider the automotive industry as a career choice. Hi, Grené. Thank you for joining me today on a Road Less Traveled podcast. I am so excited to dive into your journey. Um, so you live in, or your businesses are in Atlanta. Yes. And you have car dealerships and do you have anything else these days too? Not really. Um, just the, the Mercedes-Benz of Buckhead in Atlanta. And then we have Mercedes-Benz of Covington in Louisiana. Oh, and awesome. I'm building a new store in Forsyth County. Um, at, it's uh, Audi of Forsyth County. So Amazing. that's really keeping me, keeping me busy nowadays. That construction is something else. Big time. Um, I, I send you all the piece that I have. <laughs> Thank so, you. I'm going to jump in a little bit. And I noticed that in your bio that you are, your degree is in religious studies. How did mm -hmm. you get from a degree in religious studies to the car business? Well, being that it's a family business, as you know, we've always been in the I've always been in the car business. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I had gone to college right after high school and left mm -hmm. and took some time off, got married, had children, mm -hmm. uh, got divorced and uh, then decided I wanted to go back to school. So at, I think I was 28, I re-enrolled and um, had started back at the school that I left and then transferred to our uh, local school, Georgia State. And I had a professor, basically I was an international studies major, and there was a professor that um, was a religious studies professor, and he was just amazing. Mm -hmm. he, his class really changed my life, opened my eyes to a lot of things. And so basically I was following him in all of his classes. And it oh, turns cool. out they were like, well, if you want to uh, change your major to religious studies, you can graduate you know, earlier. So I said, <laughs> okay, <thanks." laughs> Because I had taken so many classes with them. So that's pretty much why. Oh, that's super cool. I love when you connect with someone like that. Did that professor turn out to be like a mentor of some sort? Or did you guys eventually kind of fall off after school? I still follow him. I joined the uh, alumni board, the Religious Studies Alumni Board. I am Amazing. in love with that department. It really changed my life. It opened my mind to so many things and different ways of seeing things, mm -hmm. which I think has helped me tremendously in the car business. Because well, I love that you said that because that's what's going to be my question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. go ahead. Well, it helps me as, you know, just knowing different cultures and, and, and things that are important to, to them and that we may not even think about, mm -hmm. um, you know, being from a Christian, primarily Christian, uh, you know, nation and, and, mm -hmm. and I have a Christian background. So, um, you know, that was, that was what I knew. Mm -hmm. So to learn about Hinduism and, and Jainism and, um, just everything, Buddhism, I mean, you know, all of the world religions was eye opening and it really has helped me, uh, be able to communicate with people and understand where they're coming from a whole lot more. I feel like this is just another reason that I adore you so much. One of my favorite classes in college was a secular religious studies class. Um, yeah. And I felt the same way. So I just, I love that. I love so it. family business, um, you kind of grew up in it. Yeah. And you, you said you took a little bit of time off. Did you think about a different career or were you, you know, always kind of drawn to the family business? Well, I think that, so we started the business when I was six years old, mm -hmm. so, and it was always a big family deal. So uh, we moved to Atlanta from uh, Louisiana to start the business. Mm -hmm. And so I never really considered it as either in the business or out of the business. We just always worked there. So there was definitely a time where, you know, I went to culinary school when I was oh, in my cool. early 20s and I was a chef, a, a caterer and worked at a restaurant. But I always worked as a receptionist at the dealership, you know, yeah. uh, no matter what. And I was always on call. You mm -hmm. probably are uh, familiar with that. <laughs> so, 
So it's, it, you know, it wasn't until I got a little bit older, well, actually after I graduated from, from college, finally, that I realized, oh, this is my career and mm-hmm. this is what I love to do. So I focused on it full time at that point. That's amazing. Did you, and I, the, the, the underlying question is kind of how did you get to where you are today? Um, did you go through all the departments and, you know, what were some of your favorites? Yeah. Well, frankly, receptionist was my favorite, my favorite, okay. because I think people don't realize what an impact the receptionist has on your business. We are the first point of contact. It definitely used to be with the phones and with people who walk in. So we set the tone for the entire experience. And um, so I just love that. And you have autonomy pretty much. And uh, it's just, a, I love interacting with customers. So that was really my favorite. And, uh, but yes, I took the, I think the traditional route uh, for a lot of people, you know, starting off as an entry level, level position, mm-hmm. uh, then going to service, working as, as a cashier, uh, you know, working as a, um, what else did I do? Salesperson mm-hmm. for a while. And then, in 97 is when I was working at the Pontiac store with my dad. And he said, um, I hear some dealers are selling cars on the internet. Go figure out who they are and what they're doing and do it. So okay. <laughs> of course, 1997, there were not very many. So, but I found three and I went to visit them and you know, it was very impressed by what they were doing mm-hmm. and came back to our store and implemented it. And I remember at the time, the salespeople were, uh, the traditional salespeople were like, what is she doing wasting all that time? She needs to be down here selling cars with us and all of that. And then, of course, about three months later, when I was selling you know, 12 cars a month, they're like, she's taking our deals. And, <laughs> and, uh, so, which was like, great. oh, no, they're not your deals. I'm sorry. You didn't exactly. Go you didn't want it, right? <laughs> but I was happy because my whole goal was to get everybody to engage and um selling cars this way, or at least understanding it. And so that's what we did. That's pretty amazing. Did you find that, um, that you had a different type of connection with your buyers, um, than maybe the traditional sales model, uh, not only being a woman, but being a minority, like, did you find better avenues or did you find they were more comfortable with you? Yes, for sure. And I think I have a pretty, relaxed temperament or even temperament. So people tend to feel more comfortable around me in general, I think, Mm -hmm. or so I've heard. Um, (laughs) I'd agree with that (laughs) statement. Oh, thank you. So just, I think being comfortable in the store. Mm -hmm. um, So when a customer has a a problem or issue, I don't get upset or I'm not nervous about, you know, how are we going to handle it? It's a conversation. Mm-hmm. It's let's talk about it. Let me, you know, I've got experience in this. I'm, I'm sure I can advise you as best I can. Mm-hmm. And just being genuine. Um, I think being a woman, people do tend to trust you more, especially because traditionally people don't trust car salesmen, right? Uh, or they've had, yeah, they've got, rap. oh, certainly. Exactly. So I think it was good to bring that other, uh, I'm not sure what to call it, but I guess the the feminine Mm -hmm. um, way of looking at things to the process, the sales process. Mm -hmm. And no, it doesn't have to be, I'm convincing you to do something. It's Mm -hmm. I'm here to uh, share my experience and understanding of this industry and how things work with you in order to help you achieve whatever it is that you need for your own uh, transportation. Well, I mean, a happy customer in the car business, a happy customer is a successful business, right? Um, right. And having a reasonable conversation, you would think is, the, you would think that's the way uh, to make that happen. And you do have a relaxing temperament. So I, I support that. Thank you. Um, did your, uh, your experience in getting, you know, being a first mover with, you know, online sales, uh, I saw that you have founded an online sales company. Has that, has has that helped you in that? So I did that in 2021, mm-hmm. uh, right after. So when COVID started, we all remember, I'm sure it was, um, you know, sort of an emergency situation. And we were able to use our digital sales as a, a way to stay in business during that mm-hmm. time. So um, after that was over, I had been in the store I was the one that was in the store pretty much. And then the salespeople were at home and we worked like that. 
So um, I was pretty exhausted, but also we had heard from all the manufacturers that every dealership is going to need to develop a digital sales um, platform. Mm -hmm. So my question was, and I had been doing some experimenting and we had done some pilot programs with some of the providers, the digital sales uh, providers, Mm -hmm. and just wasn't satisfied with what we were getting. And I think the technology is just what the technology wasn't quite ready yet at the time. And so um, I just said, well, if a dealership were to, you know, didn't have any kind of internet department or digital sales department, and the manufacturer said, hey, you need to have one, what would it take for them to get that going, mm-hmm. right? How much does it cost? Who needs to be involved to work it and run it? So I just sort of went on my own and, and got an independent dealer's license. It was a side project. It was a secret for a long time. <laughs> and so I just saw what it would take. I developed this online, sort of, I was using the Carvana model, mm-hmm. um, and just to see where the techno- where were the holes in the technology. Mm-hmm. And because uh, that was, like I said, my frustration before. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what we did. We saw basically what dealerships and what, you know, what was available at the time was, you know, a lot of integrations yeah. and APIs. And, and it just was very sloppy and hard to manage. So we started developing our own tool based off of the information that we Populous. got. From that, yeah, so that's, it, so that's where we are. And um, my plan is to use what we develop in the new store. Fantastic. Thank you. I I hear mixed reviews on the desire to buy online versus to buy in person. You know, like the research by and large says people want to see, feel, touch. Um, But then recently I've been getting messages in my DMs that are like, are you going to start an online car dealership? And I'm like, (laughs) what? What? (laughs) Um, so I really, I love that you're paying attention to the need in the industry and, and actually, you know, accomplishing something, um, like you said, with the APIs and a lot of the technology, it can be really, really sloppy. Yeah. It has improved tremendously. I mean, at this point, I don't know that we need my, um, version of things because the companies out there with, you know, way more money have really improved and developed. And so I think by the time the store is built, we may not even be using mine. So, well, maybe you will. Might maybe be you will. You maybe all know. the dealers will. Hey, I love that. <laughs> hey, tell it. Look, we're going into business together, right? I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. Um, so, I want to take a little bit of a segue from your personal experience into the industry as a whole. Um, you know, you and I met. Uh, at an advocacy event. So I'm curious what led you from the family business to the advocacy that, that um, you've been pretty passionate about and, and super yeah. involved in. Well, my par- my parents were always involved in advocacy and uh, on the local level here in Georgia. Mm-hmm. So we have our uh, state association, the GADA, and I just grew up with them always being involved. So I just thought that was a part of being in the business. Okay. And I realized uh, once again after the COVID experience that you know I needed to branch out and you know see what else is going on in the industry, make sure that I haven't had my head buried in the sand for too long, and uh, you know see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Plus, we had the whole uh, in Georgia, Rivian was trying to uh, challenge our franchise laws, mm-hmm. so that really got me going, and I got involved in that. Good and, and as you should. Start- yeah. And that was some, and, and a lot of times we think that we can't make a difference. But I mean, one email made a difference. I emailed one of our uh, representatives and she was like, oh, do you mind if I use your points? And yeah, so I, I really appreciated that. And then some I'm like some kind of way. Oh, I was doing a speech for NADA mm-hmm. um, and AFSA. And then um, they sort of just asked me if I would get involved on a national level because of the issues that we were having with the uh, proposed, the FTC proposed rule. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we really dealers, you know, because the reality is that if you're not in this industry, it's really tough to know how it goes and how it works. And so Mm -hmm. it's almost like there's a, you know, behind a dark curtain and you just don't know. So there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of questions, you know, are they treating me right? Am I getting the best deal? And are they being honest with me? There's just a lot that people don't know, so they have to rely on us. And um, I think that not knowing, like I said, makes people sometimes concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, 
So I think that's what was going on with the FTC, that they just want to make sure that they're taking care of the consumers. But if they don't have the information, it's really hard for them to make good decisions. So I said, well, let me get involved. At least I can contribute my voice and, and or whatever it is, is needed. And I have just loved it ever since. I think advocacy is so important. Um, a lot of times rules are made in a vacuum. Um, and it's almost as if oh, when I got involved, it seemed as if a lot of the rules were made without uh, consideration of their practical impacts and not only on the business, but on the consumer. Um, right. The FTC is the perfect example of how much more time and money that it costs the consumer to to do a transaction that they are already apprehensive about doing. Right. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, walking into a legislator's office and looking different than the people that they're used to seeing yes. um, can be super impactful. Um, so I am, as a you know, former dealer, super grateful for your advocacy. Um, and I can only imagine that it has been, you know, a little bit difficult, not only as a woman, but as a minority to, mm -hmm. to you know, to broach some of these conversations, uh, not just with our legislators or their staff, but, you know, with the general public, with just, just what are some of the challenges that you have faced yeah. that, that have been well, just, overwhelming? Yeah. I will just, like you said, showing up to DC in a room full of, uh, you know, white men. In, in navy uh, blue coats, right? <laughs> right, in navy blue coats. <laughs> It, it, I, I will say it was so good. That's why I connected with you. I think initially it was just because you were there and you were representing. So it let me know that, okay, I'm okay being here and they will accept me and, you know, as a woman. And um, so that was extraordinarily impactful for me. Oh, and it also great. let me know how impactful me being there might be for other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just kind of goes on, but it was uh, intimidating initially. Um, and I think the reality is that as a uh, African American or Black woman, um, we haven't been in these rooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I say this often, but there are only six Black women dealers in the country. I had and, no idea. In the whole country. Wow. And we have, what, over 16,000 rooftops? Yeah. yeah. I mean... So, 8% are women, that number is low, but only six. I mean, that boggles my mind. Exactly. And when I say that, people say, oh, 6%, you know, or whatever. I'm like, no, yeah, six. It, it's no, actually Boys. six. Right. <laughs> so, so I, and I, and obviously, you know, black women buy a lot of cars and yeah. we represent, you know, families and, and women in general are, mm -hmm. I think they say 80 something percent of the car buying decisions yep. make, you know, so we need to be, you know, represented. Um, our perspective, also contribute our perspective to the conversation in 100%. general. So somebody's got to do it. And apparently there are not many that are um, available right now. So um, part of my job in showing up and representing is to say that, um, yes, it is important that we're a part of these conversations and that other people should, you know, hopefully feel more comfortable getting involved as well. Uh -huh. And knowing that this is an option. Well, and I 100% agree. Um, some of the things that you and I have talked about in the past, like I said a few minutes ago, rules made in a vacuum or, you know, design elements when we're going through a remodel that don't consider the realities of the way that people live their lives. Um, so, you know, showing up and, and being there and having the hard conversations it can be, take a super big toll and be a super big challenge for you. Have you had days where you're like, F it. I'm out. I'm done. I quit. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> Every day at some point. Uh, but no, I mean, when I'm in my own store, I feel, well, even there, even there, it, it feels, you, you get a lot of that from the yeah. people in the industry, mm -hmm. but it's just because we haven't been there. It, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, you know, with this, this new store that we're doing, we had a meeting with the builder this is our, you know, my builder, my architect, mm -hmm. and we had a meeting the other day and um, Audi had sent over their plans. Uh, some are suggested, some are, are, are mandatory. Mm -hmm. So 
two of the elements that were suggested um, were the nursing station mm -hmm. and gender neutral bathroom. Yeah. So when we got to the meeting, the I'm the only woman. And um, so the men just, they started off the meeting. Oh, we look at the site plans and they say, um, oh, you know, we've already gotten rid of this, you know, gen this gender neutral bathroom and this nur nursing station. And they just moved on. Right. And I'm sitting there like, Okay, like when was this decided? But so I, they just moved on and they said, well, we've done that, you know, we're done with that. So finally I said, so what happened with the nursing station and the bathroom? Oh, we got rid of it. So then they moved on. So then I, but I kept bringing it up. So why did we get rid of it? And you could see that he was getting frustrated with me, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like, why are you, you know, asking me these questions? And so finally we just, you know, eased into the conversation and um, and explain why I thought it was important, not just for customers, but for employees who 100%. may be nursing or right. But they had never considered that. So that was just a waste of money and a waste of room and a waste of time. You know, so and it was never even thought. So I thought that. And so the guy says, the architect said, well, you know what? I'm a 47 year old man and I've only I've built dealerships my entire career and I've literally never been in the room with a woman while you know, having this conversation. So I just never have considered a woman. And it, it made me think, Hillary, I said, you know what? Women talk about um, how sometimes, you know, we don't feel spaces are created to welcome us. Yeah. And the reality is, is that is, that's true. It is true. We are considered when people are, so all these buildings that we go in, all the expressways and all these things, yes, women are coming into some of these fields now, but generally it's gonna take a minute and we're going to need, you know, to, um, you know, really get involved because uh, these spaces have not been made to uh, consider women's needs. They 100 percent haven't. I read a book a while back that talks about how the actual design of a physical city dating back to when we first were mobile with horses and buggies is not designed to have two people who are working in the household right. the city. Like our roads are not designed that way. Um, so it, it kind of boggles my mind that we're, that the, uh, the horse is behind the cart to, do, to use the same analogy still. Um, but I commend you for continuing to bring it up. I took my daughter to work for the first six months of her life and my son. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's a challenge. And, and again, with actual data, Women are more productive. They are more engaged. If you provide these very minimal things for them, you're going to get much better performance. I mean, do you find that with your female employees? Yes. Um, and so our current store wasn't built for women either. I mean, it's just be, be yeah. real. Um, so some of those issues are starting to come up uh, as far as we have a, a, a family aged mm -hmm. uh, employee, you know, or our employees are generally family bearing age. Look, I'm so old. Yeah. I don't even know what it's called anymore, but, um, but, uh, but so, you know, these things are starting to, to come up. And it, I think years ago, women would be afraid to even say that they were pregnant. Cause I mean, the, mm -hmm. the truth is that if you let on that you were pregnant, you may get fired. By and, and large, that is still a fear, uh, and I'm hearing this now, and it boggles my mind. A girlfriend told me the other day she was pregnant. She's like, I just can't tell my employer yet because they're just going to think that I've just given up. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And you're a mom. You know. Yeah. And that's why we have to engage in this way. It is uncomfortable to be the only woman, the only black woman in the room. Um, and it's not the men's fault. It's not like they're like, we don't want you here. Right. They just have never seen us there. And so it's it's different. It's odd. It, you know, like you said, our roads, our cities weren't built for women to be in those rooms. It's so it is, we are having to uh, really get involved because now women, you know, those those types of issues need to be relegated to the past at some point, uh -huh. hopefully in the near future. So people like you and, and me and many other people that we know are getting involved. And, um, and I think soon we'll see a lot of changes. So hopefully that won't continue. 
Have you had a, a super impactful mentor that has kind of coached you along or has encouraged you to go to these places that are oftentimes so uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think certainly seeing my mother mm-hmm. all of these years also in those spaces mm-hmm. has been uh, just sort of an education that I just grew up with. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't super, as awkward or or strange as it may have been. Mm -hmm. But also there's a woman, Marguerite Watanabe. I have to mention her because she has been, she's the one who taught me what a a corporate sponsor is. I mean, she didn't say those words, but I realized, oh, that's what she is. You know, she really does. I think it's very important to her that women are represented, Mm -hmm. that, you know, diversity is represented in general, um, not for the sake of diversity, but because, well, the, you know, so that we can have all of these different uh, perspectives, you know, here at the table. So she has been just amazing whenever I'm feeling down or like I can't do it or whatever, or, or I did a bad job, but like, <laughs> you know, I make a speech or something. She's like, you did great. <laughs> you know? great. Like, no way. But that made such a difference in my confidence and helping me to say, OK, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to keep showing up until I get it. So. That's incredible. Um, yeah. And I would say you're just with your relationship with me, you're definitely paying it forward. Are oh. you intentional about other, about finding women and kind of dragging them along, if you will? Because I know sometimes it can be pretty hard. Yeah. So for example, at NADA this, this year, or I guess, yeah, this year, mm-hmm. I brought a friend of mine who is looking for a different career path. She's, mm-hmm. you know, my around my age and kind of trying to pivot. And I said, you know, after speak, talking with her for you know a few months, I said, you, know, you would be really good in the car business. Mm-hmm. And so I started sending her things and just kind of read articles and see what you think. And and she got really into it. And finally, I said, well, come to NADA with me and let's just you know go look around the hall and see what all is out there and what you think. And I think that she really liked it. But it was important for it's important for me to try to identify people who are at a point wherever in their lives where they might look into this industry mm-hmm. um, because it's a great industry. You do make uh, good money. You can support your family. I mean, we need to be here. Yeah. I, I mean, it's the second, well, I say this non summing of record on repeat. It's the second largest financial decision that a family makes. Um, so I agree with you. I think it's important that we're represented within the industry. Uh, what advice would you give to someone looking to, to come into the industry, whether they're, you know, in college or like you said, your friend who's transitioning decided she needs a different, different career. Yeah. Well, I would say go on LinkedIn and, uh, and only because that's kind of what I did when I decided to, like I said, get my head out of the dealership uh, (laughs) and kind of look around, see what's going on. Um, I said, well, oh, let me um, check my LinkedIn and see what people might you know, see there. Mm-hmm. And when I went, I saw all the people in the car industry. I saw women's groups. I saw um, just every niche that you could possibly mm-hmm. want to get involved in. Mm-hmm. People are there representing and, and telling you and uh, sharing mm-hmm. their stories. And also it's easy to connect with people. Mm-hmm. I've had so many people, women, who just by seeing me on LinkedIn will reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in the car business. Is you know, is that great for me? And I'll I've mentored lots of women just literally from them reaching out to me on LinkedIn. That is super cool. Um, mm-hmm. I think that you know, there our area, like our market, our farmer market, is pretty small, so there wasn't a lot of that. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, we're kind of on an island, so I think it's incredible that, that you take like an active role in in the lives of women. You said, like you said, you can support a family. The, the average income of a, of an automotive employee is over a hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good, it's a pretty solid, you know, place to land. That's right. Especially if you're coming out of, I mean, at any time, Mm -hmm. but certainly you're coming out of college and, you know, maybe starting a family. Mm -hmm. That's a great income. Have you guys put together, have you and your stores, put together uh, pay plans or work plans that are a little more female or, or women centric. Um, 
I've, I've heard a little bit of it, a little bit of rumblings and I know that it's hard to actually make that come to light. Um, but like we've, you know, you and I've talked about like the adjusted hours or the, the pay plan adjustment of a pay plan. Um, have you been intentional about that? And that if so, where have you found the inspiration? Well, we, we've been thinking about it for years and we've made some adjustments to scheduling for mm-hmm. men and women for, you know, for families. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that's been really good. Uh, and, uh, but we haven't done too much. And my, excuse me, my plan is to start fresh with a new store and it. really think this through. Mm-hmm. And so I've got 18 months to, to do it. And um, so I, I'm, I really want to be intentional about creating a work environment where people can, that doesn't have to take away from your life, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you should be able to work and contribute to society, to everything without um, having to sacrifice being a mom or sacrifice you know, being a family member. Um, so I definitely want to put, uh, you know, different sort of pay plans. And, and I've even heard dealers uh, having several pay plans and mm-hmm. letting people choose the one that's best for them. Oh, that's cool. I heard some, yeah, I did hear that. So I'll look into that as well. But also, like you said, the hours, I mean, we can be more flexible with our hours. And I think we all learned that during COVID. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait to see how, how you do. Cause I know, I just, I know how great you are at this and I'm very excited to see how you make this, um, how you bring it to life. How Thank close you, to, you said you have 18 months from now or you had 18 months from the beginning or 18 months from um, now. Yes. Oh, okay. it, it was supposed to be 18 months from the beginning, which was uh, last March, but we had to get the land and now we're going through zoning and it's such a great experience. I mean, isn't yeah. it so good? <laughs> It's tough and, and wild and, you know, all of this, but it is just for somebody like I think you and me, um, it's the best because it's, you have to be very organized. You mm-hmm. have to manage everything uh, closely, uh, you know, because one mistake or one false move can cost you a it lot of It costs you your nursing room and it's out and all of a sudden you don't know how that happened. <laughs> exactly. Or maybe it'll cost me that break room for yeah. the, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm joking. <laughs> But yes, indeed, indeed. So we have to be very careful and very intentional and and it's a lot of fun. Well, that's amazing. Any words of wisdom that you would pass on to specifically young women who haven't considered this industry? Um, I know some of the stuff that we've talked about can be a little bit heavy or, you know, discouraging. Um, So maybe some like positives that, that might encourage them to consider our industry. Yes. Well, there are a lot of groups that have popped up like WOCAN, uh, Women of Color Automotive Network, mm-hmm. and that you can join if you just want to check it out or if you're interested. You're not alone anymore, mm-hmm. even though we're not the majority or even close to it. We are here and we do encourage. I think every woman I know in this business encourages other women to uh, or makes themselves available to other women to mentor and also to just kind of bring them in and make them feel Uh, welcome. My main advice to women in general is to show up. Yes. You know, a lot of times we get into the rooms, we start to feel uncomfortable. It's not worth it. We're going to go home. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I've got all these other responsibilities. This is, this is too much for me, but guess what? It, It may be uncomfortable for a minute, but we can push through that. As long as you show up, it doesn't really matter Honestly, as long as you're a good person and have good intentions, it doesn't matter if you, what kind of job you do, you know, if you're perfect or you do everything right. And I think we tend to want to be perfect. We, yeah. we don't give ourselves a lot of room for mistakes. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we've got to be easier on ourselves internally and go ahead and show up, you know, push through. If you're uncomfortable, just show up. Eventually you'll feel better and you will make a difference. I think and that's super sound advice. Like you don't have to say anything the first time, but you do. If you're there, it makes a difference. They yes. notice. People notice. Yeah, yeah. like build, you said, just being in the room. That's right. Builds your confidence. When we were lobbying, you know, usually I'm sure they're used to five white men showing up to have a conversation, but just the fact that here's this, you know, pop of color and a woman and yes. that thing, 
in the room, it, it perks you people up a little bit like, oh, okay, what is this about? You know, it's not just your average conversation. At least there's something different about it. And so um, you can really use that to to make a difference, even if you don't say anything, like you said. Well, Grene, I really appreciate your time. And I know this is just the first of many conversations that we're going to have on this platform. Um, I hope so. I am, I'm so excited to see, you know, how the Audi store comes out. And you know, as always, um, I just am so grateful for you. Oh, thank you, Hillary. I'm so grateful for you as well. <laughs> thank you. You, know, you are such an inspiration to me. Oh, when I, like I said, when I walked in that room and, and you were there, that made all the difference for me. Oh, thank you. It was, that was one of those, you know, just show up moments like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but here I am. But you did, you showed up and thank <laughs> exactly. you. You allowed me to show up. Well, good. I'm happy that that actually makes me feel really good. Thank you for that. A huge thank you to our incredible guests for sharing their stories, wisdom, and breaking down barriers with us. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Your support means the world to me and helps spread the word about the amazing women paving the road less traveled in male-dominated industries. If you have suggestions for a future guest or topic you'd like me to explore, please reach out on social media. I'd love to hear from you. Follow me on your favorite social platform for updates and behind the scenes. Keep pushing boundaries, challenging norms, and lifting each other up.